Father, we urge you to speak. We are here more importantly and most importantly to hear your voice. That you may speak into our lives, that you may encourage us. So speak, Abba. If there are any distractions between us hearing your voice, then would you remove that? Father, time and again, through the message, would you keep fixing my gaze upon you? Speak to us, Abba. We are your people. This is your church. This is your word. Speak to us, for I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. See, there are five big questions in life that everyone asks sometime or the other. Philosophers call it the big five existential questions of life. Five big questions. Who am I to do with identity? Where have I come from? Origin. Where am I going? Destiny. What am I to do? Morality. And why am I here? Meaning. No matter who you are, what ethnic or religious background you're from, what socioeconomic background you're from, all of us ask or answer or seek for answers of these great five questions. Who am I? Identity. Where have I come from? Origin. Where I'm going? Destiny. What am I to do? Morality. And why am I here? Meaning or purpose. The most important question that most of us ask and have been asking lately is the meaning and purpose of life. What is the meaning and purpose of life? And this question is very pertinent to people here. People who call themselves Christians. We keep asking what's God's will for my life. This past week I've had two conversations with two people who are from different ages and different stages of life asking the same question, what is my purpose? What is the meaning of this? Why am I here in this city? Why am I here in this church? Why am I here in this college, in this job, in this country? What does God have in store for me? Why has he kept me here? The three friends talking about the meaning of life. And having lived meaningful lives, they're thinking about the end of it. They're thinking so deeply about it. And one of the friends says, when I end my life, I want people standing at my funeral to look at my life and say, wow, what a meaningful, purposeful life, a life of integrity this person lived. For that is the purpose of life, living with integrity. The other friend says, you know, I want people to stand and look at my casket and say, you know, what a life of generosity. That's the meaning of life. Living generously with, with open hands. And the third friend, having heard such deep th thoughts from these two friends, you know, having thought about it for five minutes in silence, he says, you know what I want these people to do? Standing at my funeral... I want them to look into my casket and suddenly I want some people to say, see he's moving. See some of us think so deeply about meaning and purpose and God's will in our life that you know we plan the whole thing. We keep asking this question, what's God's will for my life? What is my purpose? What is the meaning? Why, why is this? Why is that? And some of us, having asked that question too many times, turn away to pragmatism, like the third friend. Look, he's moving. Is there a sure shot way to know what's the meaning and purpose? Is there a sure shot way to know why am I here? Is there a sure shot way to know whatever season of my life in that I know what's going on? I know what God expects from me. That I know that life is not just a series of random events strung together by some power. That it is a well-defined course. How do I know that? And as we bring our series in the Gospel of Mark to a close, I want to ask and answer this question through a passage this morning. How can I know what is the meaning and purpose of life irrespective of stage, 
irrespective of age, irrespective of socioeconomic status. What is that one purpose God has for my life that transcends everything? And we look at it in our passage, Mark 15, 1 to 39. Mark 15, verses 1 to 39. I've thoroughly enjoyed this series. It's coming to a close. Uh, if I would have gone ahead, I would have had to preach resurrection. Then we had nothing to preach next Sunday. So I'm stopping at verse 39. The rest you can read at home. Last week we saw the injustice done to Jesus. The judge of the world, the judge of this cosmos was unjustly judged. And Peter, who represents all of us, was justified unfairly. And this morning in our passage in the Gospel of Mark, I want to look at two things. I want to look at people's mockery and Jesus' mastery. People's mockery and Jesus' mastery. Verse 1. Chapter 15. Early in the morning, after forming a plan, the chief priests with the elders and experts in the law and the whole Sanhedrin tied Jesus up, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Last week we saw that they already declared Jesus guilty. They have, he, they have already passed the sentence on him that Jesus must die because he is a blasphemer. Because he claims to be God. He must die. But the problem here is that, that these Jewish leaders can only pass smaller sentences. They can't pass a death sentence. Capital punishment has to be doled out, has to be given by Rome. Therefore, they have to take Jesus. If they want a death sentence, they have to take Jesus to the governor. And so they tie him up, plan, and they take him first thing in the morning to Pilate, who's the governor of that region. Long story short, there is a series of questions that Pilate asks Jesus. Pilate realizes that, you know, there's not much substance to what is going on, and he offers for them to release or offers to them that he would release a prisoner. That was the tradition that during the Passover, they would release a prisoner for the Jews. And, and, and Pilate offers them, can I release Barabbas, who is a murderer, who is an insurrectionist? Go down to verse 11. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have him release Barabbas instead. So Pilate spoke to them again, then what do you want me to do with the one you call the king of Jews? They shouted back, crucify him. Pilate asked them, why? What has he done wrong? But they shouted more insistently, crucify him. Because he wanted to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas for them. Then after he had Jesus flogged, he handed him over to be crucified. See, the interesting part about the judgment is that there were several options for Jesus to be executed. Crucifixion was not the only option, was not the only death sentence or the, or the way of execution that was doled out. There was the option of decapitation. Jesus could have been beheaded. There was the option of immolation. Jesus could have been burnt alive. There was the option of being fed to the beast. Jesus could have been in the arena fed to the beasts. In fact, that was a very common mode of execution in the first century Rome. Jesus could have been given any or, or some of these punishments. But why crucifixion? It was not that a healthy man was impaled on the cross. The, the man was first or the person was first flogged, beaten brutally, and then made to carry his cross and then crucified. Why crucifixion? An author named Martin Hengel, he wrote a detailed book about this practice of crucifixion. And he says many things about this tradition. Some of them, let me tell you, four of them. He says, crucifixion, first of all, satisfied the primitive lust for revenge and sadistic cruelty. 
First and foremost, it satisfied the lust for vengeance and cruelty. Second, he says, by the public display of a naked victim at a prominent place, crucifixion also represented his uttermost humiliation. So it was not just vengeance satisfied, it was utter humiliation because this naked man was impaled on a cross at a prominent place, in a theater or in a high place like the hill Jesus was crucified on. Third, he says, crucifixion was aggravated further by the fact that quite often the victim's body was not buried. It was a stereotypical picture that crucified victim was served as food for the beasts and the birds of prey. In this way, the humiliation was made complete, no burial. And finally, he says, crucifixion was practiced above all on dangerous criminals and members of the lowest classes. It was not kept for the high and mighty. It was not kept for the dignitaries. It was not kept for the commanders and the generals. It was not kept for the Roman citizens. It was kept for the most dangerous criminals and lowest of the classes. It was kept for some, someone like Barabbas. That's why crucifixion. If the pain and the inhumane treatment of Jesus is not enough, right from the time that he was prosecuted all the way to his crucifixion, he was mocked. If the pain inflicted on him through the flogging and crucifixion was not enough, he was mocked, humiliated all through his journey. Verse 27. And they crucified two outlaws with him, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by defamed him, shaking their heads and saying, Aha! You who can destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. In the same way, even the chief priests, together with the experts in the law, were mocking him among themselves. He saved others, but he cannot save himself. Let Christ, the King of Israel, come down from the cross now that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him, the two criminals, also spoke abusively to him. See, from the lowest to the greatest, from the weakest to the strongest, from the criminals to the righteous people, supposedly, they all mocked him. From the Romans to the Jewish, from the, 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 the governor to the high priest, they all mocked him. And you see, Mark's version of crucifixion is, does not have any silver lining. In Luke, you see Jesus giving eternal life to the, to the criminals. And he says, today you will be with me in paradise. So there is some silver lining. There is some good news there. But in Mark's version, there is no silver lining. There is no good news. Jesus hangs all alone. Although he has two criminals impaled next to him. Although he has a crowd of people around him. But he stands there crucified all alone. No good news. No silver lining. Beaten, mocked, humiliated, crucified. And you've got to ask, what did he do to deserve such a punishment? He did good for the nation. He healed people. He fed people. He delivered people. Then why this? See, it was because who he claimed to be. His claim to be God was so outlandish, so out of their course, so out of their reach, so out of their imagination that they decided to crucify him. See, their mockery, humiliation, and vengeful spirit was not just because he called himself the Messiah or God, but because he did not fit their framework of God. See, if Jesus would have shown his true self to them, like he did in transfiguration, if he shown his glorious form, they would not have crucified him. 
In fact, they would have crucified anybody who would have mocked Jesus. They would have marched against Rome to defend Jesus. You see, strength begets strength. Mob attracts mob and hatred breeds hatred. But weakness, weakness attracts marginalization and humiliation. Weakness invites humiliation and marginalization. marginalization. The fact that Jesus remained silent through the ordeal mocked him as someone weak and ordinary. He remained silent. Later we'll see two things. He breaks his silence twice through this whole ordeal. But majorly he remains silent and that mocked him as weak and ordinary. In fact, less than ordinary. That is why crucifixion. They're thinking, how can God be weak? Our God is a powerful God. He is the sovereign one. He is the one. He's the creator. He's the God who said to Moses, you cannot see my face and live. He's the God who almost destroyed the world power, Egypt, through plagues. He's the same God through whose angel destroyed almost 200,000 people. Strong Assyrian army overnight in Isaiah 37. That is who God is. That is who he should be. Not him. That is why Paul says that the word of the cross, the message of the cross is folly to people. It's utter foolishness. Those religious leaders, those Jews, did not need a weak God. They were already weak. They were already under the Roman thumb. See, a weak God will have weak worshippers, right? They mock him, they humiliate him, and they crucify him. See, growing up in school, I was not a very popular kid. In fact, nobody would know my presence if not for the attendance on roll call in the first period. That's why you would bunk after the first period, not in the first period. You've got to be wise when you do those things. See, I was, I was low on the food chain. But there were few people who were lower than me in the pecking order. The lower in the, in the food chain, both in academics and in general popularity. And you would think that if I am on the lower end of the spectrum, that I would sympathize with these guys, empathize with these guys, and we will huddle together and we would just all be weak together. That wasn't the case. I would rather stand with these guys who were way up in the pecking order and mock these guys. You guys, look at yourself. Why? Because whatever little reputation I had with these higher ranking people would go away if I would be seen with these weak folks. I was already weak. Don't want to be weaker by associating with these people. See, world today does not need a crucified Jesus. World does not need a God who is crucified. The world does not need a Jesus who calls us to bear our own cross. We rather need Jesus who makes us healthy and wealthy. We do not need Jesus who allows pain and suffering in our lives. We need Jesus who answers all our prayers. We do not need Jesus who calls us to give up much. Rather, we need Jesus who's happy with the roll call on Sunday morning. Joy, check. Khatam. Go home or eat lunch. And every time our response to him is less than a yes, we mock him. But 
I don't mock him, Pastor. Yes, we do. Think with me. There are times in your life when you just can't worship God. And I'm not saying Sunday morning. When I use the term worship, I don't mean Sunday morning. Very rarely do I meet sun, Sunday morning. I would say Sunday worship. When I say worship, I mean just the life, overall life of worship. There are times in our life when we fail to worship God and you like, see this, what is happening? How can I worship you? You're allowing so much suffering and pain and, and difficulties in my life. Let me focus here. You stay there. I'll, I'll come back to you. See, in those moments when we fail to say yes to God and turn to God, we tell him that, you know, this is not best for us. What you're allowing in my life is not best for me. It's not in my dictionary, the definition of success and growth and happiness and joy and all of that, nor is it in world's dictionary of success, joy, happiness, blah, blah, blah. So if you are allowing that in my life, which according to me is not best for me, you are not strong enough to give me what I want. And because you're not strong enough to give me what I want, you're weak. Do you get the logic? There's something wrong according to you that is happening in your life, which you think is not best for you at that moment. Whatever that turmoil is, whatever that difficulty is, and because God is not able to give you what you think is best for you, at times we think Barabbas is the best for us. To release Barabbas, not Jesus. Jesus is not best for us. We do not get what we want, what we think is best for us. We turn around to God. We don't say it exactly the same way, but in our actions we say, you are not strong enough to give me what I want. What is best for me, therefore you're weak. And I'm not going to worship you. You're not worthy of my worship. We mock him. Especially if your acknowledgement of his weakness and denial of his strength is public. Then we publicly mock him. If you, like me, consider him at the, the, the weakest, and therefore in our college, in our workplace, wherever, if you fail to associate with him, that's mocking him. They mock him, humiliate him, and crucify him. Because who he claimed he was. That was their response to Jesus. People mocked him. So we saw people's mockery. Let us now look at Jesus' mastery over the situation. So Pilate asks him, he says, are you really the one who are they calling you to be? Are you the king of Israel? And Jesus' answer is at best lukewarm. He says, you are saying. Some of your version says, you have said. Now that's neither agreement nor denial. There's a problem there. See, that's traditionally the interpretation of the term Messiah. Messiah was interpreted to be a political leader. That he would come and remove Israel from under Roman subjugation and place them as a sovereign nation. Not under anyone's thumb. And so if Pilate is asking Jesus, are you the king of Jews or are you the king of Israel? If Jesus would have said chest thumpingly, yes, I am. Pilate would not have gone ahead and tried to save Jesus like he did by offering to release Barabbas or Jesus over Barabbas. So Jesus' answer is not here nor there. He's not agreeing nor is he denying because the fact that Jesus knows that their interpretation of his role is not his role. He's not there to rule with an iron fist. He's not there to rule with a scepter and a rod. Because if he would overthrow Rome, another Rome will raise up. 
World War I was called to be the war to end all wars. By force, what happened? World War II. Jesus says, I'm not, but I am. You are saying. Jesus remains silent throughout his prosecution. He suffers silently. The religious leaders, they mistake his silence for his weakness or his culpability. You see, Jesus was a silent sufferer, but he was not a weak sufferer. See, his silence was not caused by fear of any crucifixion or human torture. His silence was his posture of faith and surrender before his Abba. The night before he goes in the garden, he is conflicted, he's torn, and he prays to his father, Father, if possible, take this cup away from me. But in the end, he comes away saying, Your will, not mine. And this is this display, his silence is his display of his posture of faith where he's putting his trust in his father, his father's correct character to deliver him and to give him what he has promised him. So there are times when uh, we are at friend's place and uh, with our daughter, our 10-year-old Bella, and uh, there are situations when there is a conflict between Bella and her friend, Bella desires something and the friend doesn't want to share. Or there are times when we are in, out in the malls and Bella wants to some, buy something and we do not want her to buy that and you know, there's desperation. There are times when we don't have to explain anything. There are times when we just have to look at her and she knows. It doesn't work all the time, I hope it would, but it doesn't. But there are times when we would look at her and she would just withdraw. She'd be silent. She would just step back from the situation. It's not that her desire has gone out of her heart. That's not how human heart works. But it's just that suddenly her posture of faith has kicked in. Faith in what? Faith in her parents. Her deep trust in her parent has kicked in that they know my best. I trust them to know my best. I know that they've got my back. I know that they can do the best for me, whatever that best is. She does not stand back or hold back because of the brute force of her friend. She can stand tall for herself. But she holds back and she steps back and remains silent because of her posture of faith and surrender to her parents' will. Jesus' silence was not his weakness. It was his posture of faith and surrender to his father's will. And that is why the only second time Jesus breaks his silence through all of this narrative, through all of this ordeal, is when he cries out, not my hand, my hand, my feet, my feet, although they were impaled, they were pierced, not my head, my head, because a crown of thorns was twisted on it. He cries, my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? It was not the pain of crucifixion, not the pain of abandonment. All his disciples, all of them who vowed to be with him, have deserted him. He's been crucified for a crime that he did not commit. None of that matters. But all that matters to him is his father's distance. He quotes exactly Psalm 22, verse 1. My Lord, my Lord, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? David has written that psalm. In that psalm, David is being pursued by his assailants and he finds God to be distant. He says, why aren't you coming for my redemption? Why aren't you saving me? And Jesus is feeling the same all the more because that's his Abba. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Mark paints the picture of Jesus all alone. All alone. 
even the heavens have turned the face the jews mock him saying let's see if you can come down we'll see and believe if only you can come down the irony is jesus could have jesus could have even in his last minute he could have because of who he was but what kept him there what kept him suffering was the notion of suffering what kept him suffering was the notion of suffering dietrich bonhoeffer in his book cost of discipleship he says suffering has to be endured for it to pass away there is no other way either the world must bear its weight and collapse under it or it must all fall on jesus suffering has to be endured for it to pass away either the world must bear its weight and collapse under it or it must all fully fall on christ you see lord jesus understood that in order to keep the world from this suffering he must endure it to give hope to all people all his hope must be dashed father why have you forsaken me to promise his everlasting presence with people he has to be abandoned by all to reconcile us to the father he has to be cut and cut off the cross is not the weakness because on it god reconciled the world to himself book of hebrew says we do not have a high priest with whom or who does not sympathize with us because he went through everything that we can go through and much more and yet he was without sin philip quoted another verse by paul that god made him sin who knew no sin so that through him because of him we might become the righteousness of god see our mockery of christ changes into gratitude when we realize that suffering even death on the cross being cursed and cut off was the only way that world can truly get what it needs not what it deserves what it truly needs because we deserve judgment but we need grace in gospel says the people will not understand the strength of the cross unless they realize that the scars of christ are their salvation people even you and me will not understand the strength of the cross unless we understand that it is the scars of christ that result in our salvation one of the roman philosophers seneca in first century talking about crucifixion he said can anyone be found who would prefer wasting away in pain dying limb by limb or letting out his life drop by drop rather than experiencing once for all can any man be found willing to be fastened to the accursed tree long sickly already deformed swelling with ugly wheels on shoulders and chest and drawing the breath of life amid long drawn out agony can any man be found willing he would have many excuses for dying even before mounting the cross can anyone be willing and jesus says i am so the cross while it represents the the utter humiliation horror and a torture inhumane torture it's the best image god used to display the ugliness of our sins at the same time it is the best image that god could use to display the extent of his grace and love all of them 
on the cross. His scars are salvation. His rejection are redemption. See, it is, it is only the scars of Christ that can turn a cold-hearted killer, torturer, like a Roman centurion, look at him and say, truly, this man was the Son of God. Verse 39. The centurion would have accompanied Jesus through his flogging, perhaps would have ordered his flogging and, and, and oversaw it. He would have walked with Jesus via Dolorosa while going on the cross. He would have ordered his crucifixion, perhaps. All through that, he sees him and he says, truly the son of God. In verse 38, it says, the whale tore into two. The way to God was open. The old order was done away with. But this man didn't see that. He could not have seen that. Temple was far away. He did not see Jesus feeding the multitude. He did not see Jesus delivering people from the evil spirits. He did not see Jesus healing people, raising people from the dead. What did he see? He saw the scars of Christ. That he bore them well. And he says, truly, the son of God. See, it is not your wealth or your skill or your talent that will attract people to Christ. It is your ability to suffer well. It is not your stars that will point people to Jesus. It is your scars born in hope that will instill hope and faith. In others. If you believe Jesus to be the Lord, and if you call yourself his disciples, that there is only one fundamental option of faith and surrender. The other is you walk away. There's nothing in between. Nothing in between. Surrender to his will and his character or walk away. That's what Mark is saying throughout the gospel. Understand who he is and follow him. Do not turn back. Follow him. See, following Christ means taking his yoke and walking in his footsteps. The way of Christ is the way of scars, is the way of suffering. Not that you have to go head first in it. Not that you have to go keep inviting it. But by nature, it is that. I talked about purpose and meaning. See, the purpose and meaning of life that never changes, especially those who call themselves the disciples of Christ or Christians, is that God has called you to be his disciple. That purpose of life, to be his disciple, transcends every situation, every circumstance. Whether you have money, no money, whether you have job or no job, whether you have A job or B job, whether you're in this college or that college, whether you're preparing a civils or you've gotten through civils, whether you are 20-year-old or 80-year-old, how can I be the best disciple of Christ within the circumstances? At my marketplace job, as an entrepreneur, as a student, as a wife, as a husband, as a neighbor, how can I be the best disciple of Christ? You live that well. Be rest assured. The Lord Jesus will stand for you and say, good, well done. Good and faithful servant. That's your overarching purpose. Everything else is subsumed under it. How can I be the best disciple? 
Mark is saying throughout these 16 chapters, see who he is, understand truly who he is, and don't turn back. As we celebrate communion, not because it's the first Sunday, we do it every Sunday, because Christ said, do it as often as you meet. See, I talked about phone going off. Let's take a few moments of silence to see if we have stood with the mockers, stood with the bystanders, and have mocked Christ, either personally or either privately or publicly, because we have believed that he is weak. if not in confession, in actions, in thoughts. Father, I pray that you would renew our faith, that you would renew our wonder and awe of you, that you'll give us a greater, grander appreciation for the cross. That while it's an emblem of shame and humility and horror, it's an emblem of redemption. That if not for the cross, we would have been the objects of God's wrath. That the ugliness of the cross would have fallen on us, but it has fallen on Christ. We are redeemed because he was rejected. We are adopted because he was abandoned. Christ took the bread and he said, this is my body broken for you. Let's eat it together. This cup represents Christ's body drained of life, his blood. Every drop of it so that you and I can have life in abundance. Let's drink it together. Now may the love of God the Father and the abundant and extravagant grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the constant communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with each one of us through this week, especially this Passion Week, and forevermore, for I ask for the glory and dominion of the Father. In the name of our great high priest, who having suffered on our behalf, now stands before the Father and intercedes for us, even our Lord Jesus Christ. And by the power of the Holy Spirit and God's people said, Amen. God bless.